and it don't cost very much. I'm so sorry, Lord, won't you forgive me, please? Got a feeling it's not gonna be the last time that I. And deny what is real How long can you hate yourself For the weakness you conceal Of every earthly plan That is known to man He is unconcerned set up in his throne when he returns give you a short version of how I came to be a Catholic and a Christian, but I want to kind of roll that over into education, because this is for adult education, right? You're going to start adult education. So, something white. Really quick, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna try to. I'm gonna do my best to just not go too long on this. So, I was uh, I was raised by. I'll take anything. My mother was a. a she was raised by teetotaling Baptists, and they kept her under their thumb. Really, they were very strict. So by the time she graduated high school, she she. She headed off to Boston. And my dad, on the other hand, was raised Catholic down in Hull, Hull, Mass. And um, he, uh, he, he, he ran. He ran away from the church when he could. Um, and so I wasn't raised with any faith at all. I, I, and when I say that, there was some semblance of it because when I was 10, my parents decided to have me baptized in an Episcopal church. I don't know why they did. I'm glad they did. But uh, they decided to have me baptized in this church, and then they would send me to church. They didn't go. They would send me. <laughs> and That's perfect. That's I, I have a feeling I was, I was a bit of a handful as a child. <laughs> and I have a feeling that maybe 
this was their way of getting me out of the house on Sunday mornings. <laughs> but I think the priest, uh, the, the, the reverend there, That's perfect. said, well, he's got to be baptized, otherwise he can't come to church, right? I don't know, but this is my speculation. Because I can't understand why they decided at 10 years old to have me baptized. Obviously, it really wasn't their choice. That was when God wanted it done, so that's when it got done. But my point is, is that we did not pray, we didn't talk about Christ, we didn't know, and my parents were, I was raised a, uh, a very, uh, very strict liberal, and, you know, um, my parents were classic Kennedy Democrats, and um, so when I, when I was 10 years old, I, I took my first drink of beer, and actually that wasn't my first time, I had snuck some sips and things, my parents enjoyed having parties and things like that so you know it was easy enough to sneak out and grab a little sip here and there or something and um but at the age of 10 was the first time i ever me and a friend of mine decided that we were going to drink um, and my he, he had an older brother and you know we, we i still remember this we we split a six pack of schlitz beer <laughs> and it was behind a church in Klein, uh, massachusetts and you know i don't remember if i got drunk or anything i don't think i did i think it was kind of like you know we were we were just trying to be like the adults or something and, but one thing i do remember was that the next week i wanted to do it again and so that became pretty much the epitome of my life. Um, you know, partying on the weekends um, all the way up through high school. And by the time I was in high school, I would do any drug or anything that anybody had. It was just, it was just what we did. You know, I lived in Woburn, Mass. And I'm sure probably none of you have ever seen that movie, Dazed and Confused, but <laughs> if you ever saw it, that was my life, you know cruising around the streets, drinking, trying to score dope, keg parties in the woods, constant problems with the cops and those types of things. I never really had any brushes with the law because for some reason I was smart enough to know that I never wanted to be put in a cage. So I never, I never did anything that was really, you know, that would get me put in jail. So, and as I grew older, um, I had, I, 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 my parents asked me, you know, they said they would pay for me to go to college, and I didn't graduate high school, by the way. And my my uh, headmaster came, brought me into the, in my senior year, brought me into his uh, office and said, "Look, you know, you got three months to go here. If you just show up for school, we'll, we'll let you graduate, you know, with a D minus, whatever." And of course, I walked out of there going, "Who does he think he is telling me what to do?" And so that made sure that I didn't graduate. And I got my GED, and you know. They said, you know, to my mother, he should go to college, and she said to me, will you go? And I said, I don't know. And she said, well, we'll pay for it, but you got to promise that you'll go, you know, and, and, you know, should we even buy? And I just said, you know what, don't, don't even bother. Don't waste your money. I don't, don't want to go there. You know, all I wanted to do was go out with my friends and party. That was my life, you know. And so that's what I continued to do, as you heard in the song, and then when the 80s came along, the drugs got a little bit more expensive, and a little bit more crazy and um, I, I started to have a lot of problems with it and I got a girl pregnant in, uh, in, in 1990 and you know got engaged didn't get married luckily because uh, that wouldn't have worked out but I do have a beautiful daughter who's 26 now and has I have a granddaughter so um, God meant for her to be here, um, and uh, that's right. You were a math teacher. Social studies. Teacher. Social studies. Yeah. You said she was a good girl. My class. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> so as the '90s came in, um, and I was just completely lost. I had no direction. No, nothing. I did not. I was a complete child, grown child. I. I couldn't balance a checkbook, I couldn't keep any money, I, you know, cars repossessed, and just, my life was just a complete mess, and, and in my mind, I'm having it all, you know, it's my way, you know, and um, then I went to a, uh, I started going to a blues shows, up to this point I'd been a really big avid fan of rock and going to concerts and that whole scene, 
But when I when I turned 21, I was able to get into clubs, and then I heard blues for the first time live. And there was something about that music, and so I started. I became basically a, a groupie to some of the local blues guys. Actually, one of them, Dave, plays with now. His name is Ronnie Earl. He's one of the greatest blues guitar players in the world. And um, and eventually, I I. I started going to blues jams, and some of these guys who I considered my heroes were, were kind of urging me on and saying, you know, you, you, you might be able to actually do this. You, know, you can actually sing. <clears throat> I was completely terrified. I didn't want to sing in front of people, but they kept urging me, and then some guy heard me, and he said, look, you're in my band, and he didn't even ask me. He just said, you're in my band. You know? <laughs> we have a gig this weekend in Burlington, Vermont, Friday and Saturday night. We're going. So that's when I became a professional musician. And from that point on, things really got bad. <laughs> I mean, my life as a musician was great, and I was, you know, we had, I ended up being in a band called the Radio Kings. We got a record deal. Back then, you had to have a record deal to be able to record. You couldn't, everyone can make a CD now. But back then, if you were a band and you wanted to, wanted to have a CD out, you actually had to be signed by a record company. We got signed, and we ultimately ended up, I spent basically 1992 to 1999 with three other guys in a Chevy van, and we drove back and forth of America and up and down, and I played just about every single juke joint, dive, bar you can ever think of. Mm. Spent a lot of time in Memphis. I would get into Memphis on a Friday, and I wouldn't sleep until Monday. <laughs> and all the stuff that went along with being a musician on the road, I won't elaborate, okay, but it was just all there, you know. And this was my life, you know, and I, I would have these what we call jackpots every once in a while where you just get so full of drugs and alcohol and everything just comes crashing down on you and you realize you've got to do something about it, you know. <coughs> but I would never follow through. I'd go into a detox or something, but then eventually, you know, because I had to do it my way, um, and uh, I would end up back out. And time went on, and then one night in a, night in a club in Memphis, this woman came into the bar. Her name was Virginia. and. This bar was completely dead, and we were just having a very uninspired night. This woman came down. She sat down in front. She was just really into the band, and she was just loving it. And I kind of fed off of her. I said, oh, well, she's liking it, so, you know, we, we got going. And then she became a friend of mine, and she was like this person who, like, I can only tell you that she was one of these types of people that lost people find their way to her. And I realized that her boyfriend and some of her other friends were all these broken people, including me. So every time we'd go to Memphis, Ginny would come out, and then we'd always end up over her house. You know, and it wasn't a, a sexual thing. She was a friend. And one night, when I was talking to her, I just, I just said to her, you know, I, I'm just a really bad person. You know, I was. By now, I had met my wife, Christine, and. You know, I'll let her witness someday, but I can just tell you that, you know, God meant for us to be together, because I have no idea why Christine stayed with me. I put her through hell. And I'm on the road. I'm not even home, you know. And I felt really bad about it, and so I was talking to her, and, and I was crying, and I was just like, you know, I'm such a bad person, and I'm stuck. And, and she just said to me, she said, you know, she said, you know, Brian, the fact that you think you're a bad person means that you're not. I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, if you didn't think you were bad, then you wouldn't have the conscience, right? And she was also, I also should add, a Catholic, and she was very religious. And we'd go for these rides through Memphis, and she'd go by a church, and she'd say, hi, baby Jesus, every time she went by a church. <laughs> she was just this amazing person. And so I wrote a song about her. And... I wrote these lyrics, and then when I brought the lyrics to her, I was saying, look, I wrote this song about you, and she was saying, like, I was picking all these things for, like, artistic stuff, these ideas that were coming into my head about 
flying through the streets of Memphis on a Mustang and all these different things. And she was reading the lyrics and she's like, you don't even know what you've written here. And she said there was all kinds of references in there that I shouldn't have known about. Like that she used to own a Mustang and all these different things. So I got to, we went back to Boston and I got the song together. We rehearsed it with the band and then on the next tour we were going to go to Memphis and I just couldn't wait to play the song for Ginny. And I went into the bar, there she could be BB Kings on Beale Street, and she uh, she wasn't there. And then I found out after the gig that she was she was in the hospital. And what I forgot to tell you was that she the reason why she was such an amazing person was that she had, she had this very rare form of lupus and that she was gonna die. And she had all these doctors around her her hospital bed scratching their heads not knowing and she and it went away hmm. it totally went away and after that was when she became this person that she was that was just out for life and helping people well it came back and she was in the hospital so I went to the hospital with her and I spent the weekend with her in the hospital and and you know played the song on a little boom box for her and then we went home to Memphis after the tour and, and she was dead. And at that point in my life, I, I got this inkling that, that there was a God, that there was other things going on besides what I deemed them to be and that Ginny was part of that because of the song and how everything worked out. So. I kind of started to think of, of God and Ginny kind of sitting on a stool next to his throne, kind of advocating for me, you know. Now, I know Jesus does that now, but I, this is what my thought process was, right? And that's when I started to realize that I wanted to be a better man. I didn't have any desire to be a Christian or anything like that. So I started a new chapter in my life. It lasted 10 years. And I remember going to Central Park to see the Dalai Lama speak. I was looking into all these different things and searching and searching and searching. And Christine and I now had gotten married. We started to have children. And we started talking to each other saying, maybe we should maybe take our kids to church or something, you know? And we said, but we won't be Christian. There's no way we're going to do that. So we were thinking about maybe, or maybe like Unitarian or something like that. Because <laughs> I remember there used to be a, um, a Unitarian service on every Sunday mornings on WGBH, and it was where this kind of cool mishmash of cool music and speeches and things, and I was like, I think I can handle that, you know? Anyway, I ended up, through the years I had started to work in Europe, and I went on this tour in Italy. And before I went on this tour, a friend of mine who was a Catholic, and we were driving to a gig together, and I said to him in my searching mode, I said, you know, I, I understand the Father and the Son, but what's the Holy Spirit? I don't get that. And he, sorry about this, being a Catholic, couldn't really explain it to me. <laughs> He, was, he went to church every week, but he didn't really have any knowledge, you know. He said he kind of knew what it was, but he said, look, I got something for you. So he gives me a copy of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And he calls me like a few months later, and he goes, I was wondering how you liked that book. And I put it on the shelf and forgot about it. When he called me, I said, look, I'm, I'm leaving for Italy next week. I'll, I'll take the book with me, and I'll read it. So I started reading it in the airport, and I couldn't stop couldn't stop. I kept reading and reading and reading. I got over to Italy. And by the time I was done with that book, I said to myself, I think I can get this. I think I get this. And so I, for the first time in my life, and you heard the song, when I wasn't puking or something, <laughs> praying to God to get me out of that, because I always seemed to go to that when I was in trouble. But for the first time, I actually got down on my knees, and I, and I prayed. And I remember all I kept saying was, I'm a sinner. I just kept saying it. I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. And, and uh, I was still smoking weed, 
and drinking and, you know, doing things I wasn't supposed to do. But mostly I still knew that I wasn't that good guy that I wanted to be. I knew I was falling short, especially with, with my wife and my family. So the only thing I can tell you is that I felt God come into the room. <coughs> I, I can't tell you how it happened or what, what. I just know that I was burning this candle. I was in Switzerland, <clears throat> uh, southern Switzerland, and it was it was just before the gig. And I got down on my knees and I prayed, and and something happened. Okay, and I went to the gig, and I just went like all the guys in the band were like, what what's, what's got into you? You know. And I got back to the room that night, and I prayed again, and I prayed again, and I just, you know, the feeling was just overwhelming, you know? And I just knew, I don't know what I knew. I, I can't explain this, but I just knew, right? So I went to sleep, and when I woke up the next morning, I literally woke up, it was a Sunday morning, I literally woke up to church bells ringing. I opened up the shutters, I'm surrounded by the snow-capped Alps in this quaint little Swiss town. And the first thought in my head was, what happened last night didn't really happen. I said it was just some kind of thing in my imagination. And I was... I went into a deep depression because I couldn't believe that I was doubting it. I couldn't believe it. And let me know if I'm doing on time here. So, keep going. The, another keep going. Five. Okay, so I have to tell you this part because this is where it really gets strange. So, we go to the club and we have to load out because we left the stuff in the club overnight and we have to drive back to Italy. And this is where it really gets really weird. So, I'm sitting there, and I'm in a complete depression, and I can't believe that I'm doubting this. I know now that it was Satan. Because they were like, you know, we're losing the temple to the count. You know, get some people on. <laughs> so, so, this song comes on the, on, the, on the radio or on the jukebox, whatever, and it's the song by Prince, and it's called I Will Die For You. And I don't know if any of you are Prince fans have ever heard that song. <clears throat> But I am a huge Prince fan and have always been. And that song was on his record called 1999. And if you ever saw that movie hey, and heard any of the other songs on that record, they are filthy. I mean, they're just totally inappropriate and not Christian at all. Okay? Prince's whole vibe was a sexual thing and just a whole, you know, in your face, right? And then this song's playing, I Would Die For You, and I'm sitting there, and the, the bass player's saying, what's the matter, Brian? You're depressed, you can't, you know, you're, you're missing your family, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm missing my family. But I'm going through all this, the rest of the guys in the band, they all speak Italian, and they don't know anything about what's going on with me. So all of a sudden, the, 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 the second verse of this song comes, and this is, how this, this is how this verse goes. It goes, you're just a sinner, I am told. I'll bring you fire when you're cold. I'll make you happy when you're sad. I'll make you good when you are bad. I'm not a human, I'm a dove. I'm your conscience, I am love. And all I really need is to know that you believe. Wow. That's the verse in that song. I'd heard it a million times in my life and loved that song and never put it two and two together that I would die for you is Christ. And so that goes into my head, and all of a sudden, it was the, the, I was just elated. And I rode six hours to Italy, and of course, when I'm touring in Italy, they're all speaking in Italian, I, I'm alone, you know. And all the way for six hours, all I could hear was, all I really need is to know that you believe, in my head over and over and over again, and then that was it. <clears throat> I, I was flying home the next day, and I went to the airport, and I'm getting ready to check into my flight, and Lufthansa, I know, uh, Alitalia goes on strike. I mean, instantly, when I'm at the end, we're on strike, everybody walks out, right? They put us up in a hotel, and so I'm like, okay, I guess I have to be here another night. I'm praying again now, I'm really praying. I see this show on TV about George Foreman and how he was converted and all these different things. 
And then I prayed to God and I said to him, I said, God, you know, I know, I know I'm a Christian now. I know I'm a Christian. But I feel like I'm drawn to the Catholic Church. All right? And this is 2005. Okay? People are running away from the church at that point in time. And I think, I'm, I feel like I, that's where I'm supposed to go. But I don't know. And I know Christine is going to go ape if I come home and say one more time. <laughs> so I walk outside and I start walking around randomly and I'm looking at the stars. And I look down the street and I see this little thing that looks like a bus stop. And it's a cinder block building. It looks like a bus stop big enough for people to stand in. I'm walking down the street and I look over and it's this huge statue of the Blessed Mother. And there's candles all around it. There's a picture of her holding the, the Madonna and child. And, you know, and I walk up and I said, okay, you know, I, I got it, you know. So now I got to go home and tell Christine. I get home, I tell her, you know, and I said to her, look, I, I got to talk to you, you know. And I'm coming home from a road trip and she's like, oh. like, she's thinking the worst, right? Like, you know, here we go again. <laughs> and I'm like, I said, look, I, I just want to let you know that I'm a Christian now. And she's like, what? I said, I'm a Christian. And I said, it is more. <laughs> and I said, I think I'm going to be Catholic. And she says, she literally says to me, that's the worst one. <laughs> I was really upset. <laughs> and so I just she says to me, look, can't we do something else? Some other Christian thing, other Christian church, just not Catholic, please. And I, I said, look, I said, do you do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and was saved? And she said, No. And I said, Well, look, just let me do this then. Just let me do this. And so I looked up and I saw St. Mark. <laughs> and I came here the next Sunday. And I, I, I decided I had to read the Bible when I got home. And I read, decided to read John 3.16. Mm -hmm. I'd seen that in football games. You know? <laughs> 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 Sorry, football games. I said, well, where is that? John 3.16. Right? And I read that and I ended up reading all of John. And when I get to uh, church, uh, they're reading John, you know, and, I, and the, the gospel reading is Deacon Lee reading the gospel, reading John, and I'm just like, I know this! <laughs> so I walk out at the end, I talk to Deacon Lee, I'm going to go fast now, sorry. I talk to Deacon Lee, and Deacon Lee says, well, why don't you come on in Tuesday, we'll talk about it. And I end up going into RCIA, and Paula Gagudi was the director then. She was the Catholic Church for me. I'll never forget that you might be the Catholic Church for somebody. Deacon Lee was, but Paula was the Catholic Church for me. She's the one who, you know, and so I went through RCIA and Christine came along and now she, I'm in her dust. <laughs> um, and it's funny too because she said to me, I gave her mere Christianity and and after she started coming to RCIA, she said to me, she said, uh, well, you must have really been praying for me to come along on this, huh? And I was like, yeah, I didn't even think to do that. So just to tie this over into the education part of it, all right? So I had the blessing to start off in RCIA, and I cannot tell you how much that year meant to us. And Christine, she's a real prayer warrior and scripture reader type person. I love info. I want to know stuff. And that's what RCIA was giving me. And I couldn't wait to get back. And one of the reasons why Christine ended up coming along, she told me later on, was because once I started RCIA, I had to be there for the 8 o'clock mass. And she was convinced this phase was going to go after that. <laughs> she knew, I'm a musician, but she knew I was not going to make it there at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning. I still was doing gigs, but I could not wait to get there. And she ended up coming along. And since then, I've taken a couple of other things. It was a great thing, History of the Catholic Church I took. And then I had the absolute blessing, Father Pennant and Deacon Lee, um, they 
approved me to be able to be part of the call to servant leadership, which I don't think they do anymore. I uh, hope they started that from the beginning. For three years, I, with a group of people, every Wednesday night we went to St. Anselm and that we learned and learned and learned and learned. I cannot say enough about learning about this church because it is so full of so many things. The information, and I'm going to tell you what, some of it's scary. You know, I remember one time in RCIA, I don't know if Lorraine, you remember this or not, Deacon Lee came in and he taught us one week about scripture. And he started talking about how maybe the Gospels weren't written by those people and it was in this time and the and this, that, and the other thing. I remember everybody was like, what? Well, especially the cradle Catholics. They were like, what, what are you talking about? And when we, we did some Old Testament stuff during the call of servant leadership with this great professor up at St. Anselm, and she even said, let me know if you have any crises of faith or anything. Because, you know, the information can be a little scary, you know, because we want things to be comfortable. Um, but... Um, I, I need to wrap this up, so um, I just want to say I, I hope that you do this um, education. I, I don't know if it's definitely going to happen. Or, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you learn about this church, and, and it also comes in really handy because there's a lot of people out there who are, um, who are against this church, and they're equipped to, uh, to tear it down. And it's good to have a little bit of uh, info, you know. They, they figure a Catholic's going to be a pushover. But you can kind of say, well, wait a minute here. Actually, you're not, you're wrong, you know. So anyway, I've talked enough. And someday I'll write a book about this and you can buy it. But. <laughs> play guitar with me. Yes. Yeah. I want to play harmonica. Phil, 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 whatever. I want to play harmonica on this one.
to a land where the joy will never 